Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. Jonathan Marion believes that when we live, connect, and communicate authentically, we send out ripples. These ripples make the world a more caring and connected place, one ripple at a time. Having seen this dynamic over 20-plus years as an award-winning cultural anthropology professor and author, Jonathan feels that how we show up is the key to living deeply meaningful and fulfilling lives, and he now works as a transformational life coach to be a catalyst for exactly such transformations. As a coach, consultant, and speaker, Jonathan draws on decades of experience teaching diverse audiences. He is trained in emotional intelligence, group coaching, positive psychology coaching, clear beliefs coaching, and body-oriented coaching. Overlapping his coaching and academic work in powerful and unexpected ways, Jonathan is also passionate about his work as a photographer and a partnered dance instructor, now primarily focusing on Brazilian Zouk. Bringing all of this together, Jonathan is passionate about supporting clients and audiences in transcending external relationships as measures of success so that they can live a truly aligned, rewarding, and meaningful life. Well, Jonathan, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here. I'm hoping you can share with us a little bit about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. I had been working as a cultural anthropology professor and in the first half of 2019 was down in Brazil doing research and staying with a very good friend of mine. And I was sitting in his living room one day and looking out the window across the street, and it's not a touristy part of town. It's where locals live. And I was thinking, why is it that I'm in a room here that's smaller than the closet at my house, and I feel more at home here? And it struck me that it had to do with the quality of relationships and that it wasn't uh, people around me who were concerned with what I did or my accomplishments but were genuinely interested in connecting with who I was as a person and loved that person. And that staying in academia, especially as it leans more into a business framework, at least in the United States, really wasn't serving me. And so then I took a step back and I said, well, what part of the job have I loved? Well, I'm good at the research, but I don't love it. Uh, That includes the academic publishing. I'm good at the professional service, including leadership, but I don't love it. I do love teaching but it's not delivering information. It's helping people figure out their own questions and how they're going to find their own answers. I uh, got to do a lot of that with my master's and PhD students, got to do it with, you know, the undergrads who would come in either 10 minutes before or after class and have these ideas that had, you know, popped up in their mind from whatever ideas we'd been discussing. And I realized that's life coaching. That's helping people figure out their questions and how they're going to find their own answers. And so that's what really led me in this direction. Well, that's, you know, quite a gift, that realization you had there, that uh, you felt more at home in that small space than in your own own home. Absolutely. And it's interesting because I didn't know it at the time, but uh, since then, as I've transitioned out of academia and uh, into this other life, I've gone from, you know, first a three bedroom plus an office house to a one bedroom apartment to now I've been living as a nomad for the past year and a half. And while I will resettle sometime next year, uh, just realizing how little it's the things and the accomplishments that lead to a meaningful or fulfilling life. And, and what is it that you replace that with? Yeah, for me, I think it has to do with authenticity and, you know, and how we live and how we communicate and how we connect with other people. And that in doing that in a certain way, we send out ripples into the world, not just as far as who we impact, but then how they show up to other people in their lives and how they impact those people. 
And that helps create a more caring and connected world, one ripple at a time. So how would you define authenticity for these purposes? Yeah, so there's a lot of really good work out there that's been done um, on finding your meaning. Uh, everything from the work of uh, Victor Frankl and logotherapy to more recently Simon Sinek and his work. And I think there's a lot of value there. But I think in the moment, it can be really hard to connect with your why. And what I found is it has to do with how do I want to show up? How do I want to be in my life? How do I want to be in the interactions and the relationships I have? How do I want to be in challenging situations? And if I can find an answer that says, yes, that feels right. If I look back on this moment, this decision, this interaction, five years from now, I'll be like, yeah, I'm glad I did it that way. That's being authentic. So in that definition, being aware in the moment and being able to assess as you're in the process of doing something, will I be satisfied with these results? Almost as though are these these words or actions that I'm putting forth in this moment in alignment with who I'd like to be or who I, or or the kinds of qualities that I value in myself and others? Absolutely. And I think what you're pointing to right now is the most important part, which has to do with the values part, because I don't know what the outcomes are going to be. I can't say um, this is how I want to show up for X result because we don't control the results. So much of life is beyond what we can do. And um, I don't even remember where I heard this when I was younger, but uh, the idea that, you know, life is 10% how we make it, but 90% how we take it. Um, and so it has to do with, look, things are going to happen that I have no control over, but how do I want to show up in this situation? How am I going to be pleased with my decisions and my actions, um, despite however things may go? And the other thing that just happened when you were talking about having this realization was it, it, it brought to mind the movie I Am by Tom Shadyak. Are you familiar with that? I vaguely remember having heard it, but it's slipping my mind at the moment. The, the, the idea is that he was this uh, highly successful director of movies, Liar Liar and other things mm -hmm. with, you know, millions and millions coming in and people telling him you need a bigger house you need a bigger car you need a bigger mansion you need a bigger and uh after he'd had his post-concussive syndrome with critical headaches that push a lot of people to want to just end their lives and he was lucky enough to recover from it he started questioning okay so what's the value of life etc but the bottom line was that he ended up selling the mansion and moving into a mobile home park that was close enough to be able to ride his bike to work and um, restructuring his life in that way. Downsizing is one of the phrases a lot of people use today, but with the clarity of what he wanted to accomplish and the kinds of relationships he wanted in his life. And it was a tremendously positive result for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that resonates a lot. And I, I, sort of have, uh, it's not a parallel, but a rather analogous experience. Um, I'd come back to the U.S. in the middle of 2019 from that trip to Brazil and really, you know, had the direction. I knew I wanted to get training to become a coach and that that was the direction I wanted to go and had really thought a lot about the value of just that's intrinsic to being and the idea that we're human beings and it's not just human doings and we're not all about doing an accomplishment. And I really thought I understood the idea and I was on that team being, if you will. And then in no early November of 2019, um, for reasons we still don't know, I had a very severe spinal injury with nerve damage. And for five weeks, I couldn't even roll onto one of my sides on my own. And, uh, was really faced with that existential challenge of, you know, am I the same person? Do I have the same value in the universe if I can't do all the things I did before? And while I would never want to repeat the experience, um, nerve pain is no joke. I also wouldn't give it back because it really helped me gain clarity on what were the things that were most important and what were the things I could influence, which was, again, how did I show up even when circumstances were beyond my control? Yeah, that's powerful. It's a, it's a blessing when we are able to use those life events 
to gain a positive perspective. Um, and, and we all know of people who've had those kinds of things and it, it devastates them and leaves them with a much more negative outlook. Yeah, it isn't automatic that you get the positive outcome. So congratulations, and and that's a nice piece of luck. I mean, I don't, I, I for for myself, I just felt fortunate that when I had that kind of thing in my life, I'd had the right kind of parents, I'd had the mindset where I chose the path of okay, how can I make the best of this rather than, you know, using it as motivation to just give up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. Unfortunately, I've seen up close the other side of it. Um, very unfortunately, when I was 18, my mother was in a pretty bad car accident that left her with some uh, permanent uh, brain uh, trauma. And, you know, that is tragic. And it had a massive impact on her and on our relationship and on the family dynamics. But it happened. And... I think what was the most sad to me was not that it happened, but through the end of her life, uh, what was it, 38 years later, uh, it was always for her, what did she get cheated of as far as the relationships and the life she could have led? And so, yeah, something tragic happened, but getting so attached to the what could have been never allows you to really lean into and discover the what could be. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a blessing when we have the ability to look for what could be and appreciate what already is. I think that that really is the key because what is, is. And so the minute that we start uh, using terminology, even in our own brains, even in our own self-talk about should, things should be this way, this person should act that way, the outcome should be this we're fighting with what is. Obviously, it's not. And so for me, one of the really key sort of realizations and then tools that I both use with myself and with uh, you know, clients or in speaking engagements is just replacing those shoulds with coulds. So just even keep a journal through the week every time you say should or think should, and then just at the end of each night, go through it, cross out should, put could. And just think through how different that is and just see what happens over a week of doing that. So are there other structures or tools that you use with people when you're assisting them in this kind of a realignment of view and perspective? Yeah, there are a few. Um, I think as far as sort of uh, quick touch points to just get people started, because sometimes you need something. You need some point of friction where you can hang something on it. Could not should is a, one of the powerful ones. Um, shifting the idea from blame to responsibility. Um, and I think, yes, sometimes that really is important as far as how we look at others, but it's also really important with how we look at ourselves. It's so easy to fall into self-blame for not doing things the way we think we should have, right? Um, those shoulds get attached to ourselves a lot too. And so recognizing, sure, I have responsibility for the consequences of my actions. It doesn't mean I'm to blame. So a simple everyday example, a parent is on their way to pick up their child at school, but because of a traffic accident, they don't get there in time. They're still responsible to pick up their kid, but they're not to blame that they weren't there on time. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of not recognizing the difference. And a third sort of, starter point, if you will, that I think about and suggest a lot is differentiating interest from intention. And I'm not talking about our intentions for ourselves, because yes, it's important to set intentions and try and follow them. But when we're interacting with other people, if we have intentions for the outcomes, I think it's really problematic because it means we're acting and interacting with them in very instrumental ways. We're doing things for an outcome as opposed to this is how I want to show up and I'm interested in what happens. I'm interested in where this goes. And so I think this one shows up the most uh, in interpersonal relationships, in communications, whether it's with family or romantic partners. I'm expressing where I'm coming from. I'm asking you questions, but it's not because I have an intention for what the specific outcome is. If so, I'm not actually interacting with you authentically as 
what emerges between us, I'm really working instrumentally uh, to try and get an outcome. That's a lovely way to put that. The idea of my being interested in how this will unfold rather than my having an intention that it unfold a certain way leaves that flexibility and puts me in that in that space almost like on the canoe you know in the canoe on the river where i can i can use what the flow is to the and have some impact but i'm also being you know affected deeply by the flow of the river itself absolutely and again i think any good conversation follows a similar thing if it's i know what i'm gonna ask and i know what my answers are going to be regardless of what the other person brings to the conversation, it's not a conversation. And I also, my mind instantly wants to just take that same approach and apply it to life itself, not just my interactions with another person, but my interaction with the flow of life events throughout the day. Mm -hmm. I have some kind of an intention about what I'd like to do and how I'd like to show up, and I'm interested in what's going to unfold. And often it's very different than what my head planned for the day. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And it speaks to the idea of it's one thing to have an intention for what my output is going to be. That's totally different from having an intention for what the outcome is going to be, right? So what am I going to put out into the world? Sure, have an intention because you have the ability to choose that. But as far as what's going to come back, that's when it's really important to navigate those, you know, waterways, as you were speaking about, about, you know, figuring out where the flow is, and how to ride those in the way that you want to, rather than trying to fight them. So what are some of the other approaches or tools or tricks, tips that you use in working with people? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I really break it down into two categories. Uh, the first is strategic, as in, you know, big picture. What is it that someone is going to be able to do to live what is going to be a meaningful and fulfilling life for them? And then the second one is tactical, as in how do they actually go about doing that? So the strategic one is what I um, came up with as the being model, B-E-I-N-G. And it goes back to that real, you know, crucible of experience when all I could do was be, when I didn't have the ability to do anything, when I had the spinal injury. And uh, so being, B is for begin where you are. Because I think all too often we rush to try and figure out what outcomes we want. And if you think about navigating, whether it's on a map or using the GPS in your car or on your phone, if you don't have a signal that tells you where you are now, if you don't have a you are here point, you can't navigate anywhere. And I think that's one of the places where that idea we were speaking about before of what is, is, is super important because beginning where you are has to do with what is, um, depending on where someone's coming from, one of the things sort of strategies I'll lean into there um, actually comes from positive psychology, because I think all too often uh, we grow up in a society that's criticizing gaps and lacks and certain versions of um, early uh, psychology also leaned into the deficiencies model. And we all have things that are aptitudes and abilities. And so taking full stock of those as far as part of where we are now and what we bring to the table, I think can be really important. The second step for me, um, the E to being, is explore where you're going. And I think that's so important because it's very easy to say, you know, I want to get out of here. I want to go on vacation. Um, okay, accept it. That's why we're having the conversation. That's why we're looking at this. But the places you want to go, why those places? Are those really the places that give you the most? And so I think a classic example that gets used a lot here are people who are always trying to get promotions at work. And sometimes, absolutely, that's the right step for people, oftentimes. But sometimes it's because there's a pressure of that's what you're supposed to do. Sometimes it's an idea of, oh, well, then I'll have the resources to go on vacation with my family more. Okay, great. Why is that important? Oh, I love spending time with them. How important is that? Oh, that's the most important thing. Well, will you get more time if you take this promotion and the nature of the job is you have less time? And so again, the exploring where you're going, what's important about it to you, what's really the right place is I think a really important step. Once we've done that, I is identify your options. 
because we've all traveled different places, even if it's from home to work or to the neighbors, and there's more than one option. Um, are you someone who likes taking the most efficient route, the most scenic route? Uh, are there stops along the way that you want to visit? Are there, you know, relatives, uh, friends from back in the school days who are somewhere along the way? Opportunities to uh, go to a training seminar that you wouldn't have normally, but given the route options, may be opening up. So really identifying what are all the options. And I think part of that is also identifying how have you made the choices that have been best for you in the past? Are you someone who pro and con lists uh, really have led you to what the decisions you're the happiest with? Are you someone who just leaning into what pulls at your heart, you know, that's given you the results you're the most satisfied with in the past. And so really identify your options for identifying what are the best options for you as part of that as well. The N is now start. And I think this is so often and so easily overlooked. We get so busy planning that we don't actually begin. And that's part of the trap of perfectionism. That's, and perfectionism is, perfectionism, excuse me, is a version of shoulds. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, especially if you've assessed where you are, you've assessed where you wanna go, you've assessed your options for getting there, if along the way you decide you change your mind, no worries. You're already on your way and you know why you've made the decisions you have. And it's very easy. Um, in life, detours happen all the time. But if you're very clear about where you're trying to go and how you're trying to get there, it's not a big deal. It's a detour. Or maybe you decide, oh, wait, there's a sign that there's the largest, I don't know, ball of twine in the world, only you know, 30 meters down this street. Why not? We're here anyway. But if you don't start, you stay stuck where you are. And if you have a perfect life already, great. Congratulations. I want to know your secret. But if not, starting a change is the most important change you can make. And then the G is getting your best life. And I don't mean that it's perfect and everything is set. What I mean is that it's far too easy to lose track of what are the things that are actually fulfilling? What are the things that are meaningful? Because we're so used to chasing what we're supposed to do and external measures of outcomes. And so as you start to live in a new way and arrive where you really wanted to, appreciate both the journey, but also what are these differences? And from having done this process, recognizing that you now have the capacity to go back and do that partially or entirely at any point if just what's meaningful to you in your life shifts along the way. So that being strategy is the strategic piece. Um, and just uh, very briefly, uh, tactically, uh, the things I use for that, because it can be really tricky to keep track of all of that at once in the flow of life, especially in heated moments, in charged moments. Uh, I already alluded to it before, but I ask myself the question, how do I want to be? And whether it's with this person or in this particular interaction, how do I want to be? And if it's so charged that I'm really struggling with that, then what I call future casting, I ask myself, what will five year from now, Jonathan have wanted me to have said or done right here and now? Because believe me, I've had too many experiences in my life where, you know, whether it's two hours later, two weeks later, two months, two years, I go, son of a, I wish I had answered this way. I wish I had done that. So I think that stepping back just enough to ask not how do I want to be right now if it's too heavy, if it's too complicated, if it's too charged, but how will the five year from me now version have wanted me to show up right now? And when that's a challenge, exhale. All too often we're told breathe deeply, but we start by inhaling. You can't inhale very deeply when you already are tense and there's all of this already, there's this air in your lungs that's already most of the oxygen's out of. Exhale, exhale as deeply as you can, then take in the air for a new breath. Exhale again, take in a new breath. Now, what will the five year from now, Jonathan, have wanted me to do or say 
or be in this moment. And it may be very hard to do, but it's pretty simple to identify if you're really willing to look at it. Yeah, it's an excellent practice. There's a number of those that come from indigenous people that talk about, you know, in this moment, I'm doing this for all my relations and generations and or how will the decisions that I'm we are making here affect seven generations down the road? And those kinds of frame, framing and questions, you know, th there's a reason across cultures that people say this is a really useful thing to do because it helps us get centered and, and get, as you say, out of the intensity of the moment and uh, often come up with a solution that we find more useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, you're probably familiar, but uh, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation because I don't speak Lakota, but the Lakota Sioux um, saying of Mitakuye Oyesin, uh, which sure. variously translates as all my relations or all my relatives. And it doesn't just mean humans. It means the spirits of everything from the animals to the plants to the rocks to the streams and that you know as a greeting and as a goodbye it's an important constant reminder that how we live and how we show up is never divorced from everything else the the, the wonderful stuff that that we open to if we start reading some of the indigenous people's uh, wisdoms. I, I was going to say literature, but it really, a lot of it comes down as oral traditions and then has been written. But there's a, a wonderful book by Pierre Pratervan on the gentle art of blessing. And then a number of years later, he wrote a, a book about uh, 365 blessings to heal myself and the world. And in that, he has a number of different blessings from indigenous peoples that are just deep and rich and uh, one of them when I read that book I chuckled because I'd read a an anthology of Native American literature in high school and I used it for a banner one, one of the quotes and it was um, I seek strength not to be better than my brother but to fight my greatest enemy myself and that came across in at least two, if not three different places in uh, Pierre Pratervan's research of blessings from indigenous people. So yeah, getting, being willing to step back, take that breath, hold it and let that long, slow exhale out is the way I coach people to do it is a, a great way for me to get centered and give myself the space to step back in view and get a whole different perspective on the present moment situation. Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the things that really we don't pay enough attention to is the difference in speed of physical evolution versus cultural evolution. So we only have one nervous system, but it's the one that's physically evolved. And so we've expanded the fight or flight um, model to include freeze and fawn and some other things along the way. But if we think about evolutionary, what triggered that? Well, it's actual life threats so for example big bear okay so flight run away i get away fight bonk bear on head with rock i get away freeze bear ignores me i get away fawning doesn't work so well with bears um or there's an unfortunate outcome and i don't get away but if i get away then the actual threat is gone and all of those stress hormones that get released into our system get to dissipate. But what are the things that trigger that same onset of stress and those autonomic responses in today's society? It's traffic jams. It's your boss. It's, you know, conflicting pressures at work. It's being torn between uh, different family uh, obligations. Where's the point where we ever escape those things the way we escape the bear and get to let that all drain out of our system? And I think that's part of why it's so important, as you just said, to find those different strategies from indigenous traditions, from different current, uh, you know, even apps, whatever works for you is what's important to use. But what are the things that allow you to step back and release all those things in a society that's 
really not built to ever let you out of that space. Well, and the uh, one of the most useful things that I've learned in the past many years of doing therapy is the, the parsing of the language is so important. So when you're saying what's causing my stress is the traffic jam, the boss's pressure, et cetera. And if we study this and realize it really isn't that external thing causing it, it's the interpretation that I'm choosing and placing on it. And then I'm using that same physical tension system that I've adopted without any adaptation. I just took it from fight or flight with the bear to this, <laughs> this upset because I think the boss shouldn't be doing that. And so it's all accessible if we learn to shift the interpretation and then the response. And that that's so useful. I, I really appreciate having another acronym like being the one you've just given us. And that idea of from slightly a different perspective, shifting what we're making something mean, because it's the meaning we give it that we then use to generate the physiological or stress response within us. Absolutely. Because again, the boss criticizing you at work, the traffic jam, that's not actually an existential threat the way a bear is. But because we don't pay attention, because we're not as uh, mindful as we could be, the response is that natural trigger. And so, I mean, to think about, you know, horror movies or things like that. We know it's make-believe, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't actually trigger something in our system. And so the idea of whether it's things, um, you know, in magazines or what have you, where it's Photoshopped and you're like, oh, but I know it's been manipulated. That doesn't make us immune to it. If it did, there would be no advertising industry, which is worth how many billions. Just because you intellectually know something doesn't on its own change its value to you unless you really do pay the attention and do the work to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to actually choose to let it play out this way. I am going to shift the stimulus value it has for me and the meaning that I allow it to have in my life. Excellent. Well, I don't want us to be rushed here. So I'm looking at the time and thinking it's a good time for me to ask you to take a breath and get centered and think about what we've talked about so far. And if there's something in that that you'd like us to go back to and highlight or something I haven't even asked you about yet with your work with people that you want to get in here before we move toward wrapping up. And thank you for that invitation. And I think uh, it's a good reminder for all of us always that you can step back and uh, take stock a little bit. I think there are sort of two brief things uh, that I would just follow up on slightly. One, which has to do with this stress response, um, but also the why are some of the tactical strategies of future casting and the like so important? Well, it's because a lot of stuff is coming up in the body. And so I think attention to that and different ways to um, navigate what uh, can be not so mainstream are really important. So, you know, this whole idea of mind-body connection I think it's really important, but I also think there's a little bit of a mistake there because it's still rooted in the idea of mind and body are separate. Because how can there be a connection between things that aren't separate? And so attention, uh, whether it's through body-oriented uh, therapy or coaching, somatic uh, approaches, um, again, a lot of indigenous approaches don't differentiate between physical, uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, even social health. And I think that's wise, and it's for a reason that those traditions have existed as long as they have. So just, you know, whether it's separate from taking a breath in the moment, you know, look outside, find something in nature that your eyes just want to rest on for 20 seconds. If they're happy there, let them rest there. If they want to move on, let them move on. But just do that. And, you know, if you can take a walk outside, if you can breathe, you know, air around plants or trees, whatever it is that just lets our nervous system say, wait a minute, the world's okay. Even if I'm stressed in the moment, I think is really important. And for people who really aren't used to having a way to release those things in their system, finding approaches that allow those things out. For some people, it's 
you know, easy enough. They find if they go running or lift weights, they do it. For some people, it's, you know, playing a sport or dancing, whatever it is for you, great. And if it is finding someone that, you know, can help, great. But I think it's a really important part of the picture as well. And the last thing I would just expand on then, you're bringing in the, you know, value of different indigenous traditions really speaks to this, but it's the idea of other hows that there's lots of ways that people all over the planet have done things through time and through different traditions. And none of them are inherently any better or worse than others. Yet at the same time, they all deserve, you know, full dignity and respect. They may not make sense to us because we've grown up with different frameworks, but no one on the planet woke up in the morning ever and said, this makes no sense to me, so I'm going to do it that way. They may have thought their options sucked, let's be honest, but I guarantee you that whatever they decided on, they thought sucked less than the other things that they were aware of as possibilities. No matter what someone has chosen to do, it made sense to them. And if we can hold that idea um, as true and with real integrity, look at they did this, they thought this way, they came up with this because it made sense to them, then we can both have a lot more compassion for choices that we don't agree with, but we can also recognize some of the real possibilities in systems that we don't yet understand and approaches that we're not yet familiar with. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm flooding with all kinds of different associations there. The, uh, I frequently tell people when they come to see me in therapy that my assumption is, although I'm willing to be proven wrong, but my assumption is that they're not sick, crazy, stupid, lazy, or masochistic, which means they've got really good reasons for everything they're doing, even if they can't figure them out with the conscious logical part of the mind because the unconscious is so deep and rich and full. And what that means is, Everything they've done, doesn't matter. They could be 5,000 people observing saying, oh, that's stupid. And, but out of the options I can see in this moment, I'm always going to choose what I think is going to hurt less, even if I'm doing something that's going to cause me fairly direct discomfort or distress. It's because it's the least disruptive or distressing thing that out of all the possibilities I can see. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap there in the work, and obviously in some of our source material that we've been tapping into over the years. The other thing is the idea that uh, within the culture, the context of our culture, and it's there's been a lot of ebb and flow over it in my lifetime, the stresses that we have imposed on us from the outside, I mean, the things that require us to make adjustments, they ebb and flow, but they, they're getting more and more intense in terms of demand for our time and attention. And as you mentioning advertising, and there was a gentleman who was the uh, second to the Dalai Lama, and he was out in Oregon, and he came across some work that was the root of the Journey's Dream material. And he said, you know what, uh, over in Tibet, we don't need this. But here in America, our monks need this work. Right. So if, if I'm in a pressure cooker, I'm going to need a different set of coping mechanisms that I'm, I'm I'm in this idyllic island situation with all my needs easily met. And uh, I, that's why I think, you know, someone from your perspective can be so useful to people to help them identify. All right. So if this is your current context in your family and your job and your ideals and your environmental situation, what might you develop in terms of strategies and adjustments so that you can create a culture that leaves you feeling good about yourself to paraphrase uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. That feels really resonant for me. And I think part of the difference is uh, from approaches where it's basically like, here's a recipe to follow versus here are techniques for preparing different things. And here are the ideas between complementary flavor profiles and the like. And let's make sure that you gain as much expertise in that as you can. And now you can cook whatever you want with whatever's available at any time, wherever you happen to be and with whatever tools you have on hand. Excellent. 
Well, I will reach out to you after this um, and send you a couple links that got sparked in my uh, brain as we were discussing that I didn't talk about previously. And uh, I appreciate your being willing to share with us. Wish you well wherever you land in this next year or two. Yeah, thanks greatly. Um, looking forward to reading the links. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of overlaps in some of our areas of uh, interest and background. And uh, looking forward to just adding some uh, more sort of uh, tools to my own kit as far as uh, frameworks and uh, strategies. Well, I will send those along. And thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Jonathan Marion believes that when we live, connect, and communicate authentically, we send out ripples. These ripples make the world a more caring and connected place, one ripple at a time. Having seen this dynamic over 20 plus years as an award-winning cultural anthropology professor and author, Jonathan feels that how we show up is the key to living deeply meaningful and fulfilling lives, and he now works as a transformational life coach to be a catalyst for exactly such transformations. As a coach, consultant, and speaker, Jonathan draws on decades of experience teaching diverse audiences. He is trained in emotional intelligence, group coaching, positive psychology coaching, clear beliefs coaching, and body-oriented coaching. Overlapping his coaching and academic work in powerful and unexpected ways, Jonathan is also passionate about his work as a photographer and a partnered dance instructor, now primarily focusing on Brazilian Zouk. Bringing all of this together, Jonathan is passionate about supporting clients and audiences in transcending external relationships as measures of success so that they can live a truly aligned, rewarding, and meaningful life. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.